On June 5, 2016, Pope Francis canonized the Polish priest, Father Stanislaus of Jesus and Mary Pepczynski, who was the founder of the Congregation of Marian Fathers of the Immaculate Conception of the Most Blessed Virgin Mary. Along with St. Maria Elizabeth Hesselblad of Sweden, St. Stanislaus was the first saint canonized during the extraordinary Jubilee Year of Mercy 2016. St. Stanislaus is the latest in a series of great Polish saints canonized in the past 35 years, including St. Maximilian Kolbe, St. Faustina, and St. John Paul the Great. St. Stanislaus lived in the 17th century and is remembered as a propagator and defender of the title of Mary's Immaculate Conception nearly 200 years prior to the Church's proclamation of the dogma in 1854. He was a great advocate of praying for the dead and the dying. He provided tireless assistance to pastors in nearby parishes, and he was a zealous promoter of the faith among the laity. In this video series, we want to come to know this great new saint of the Church and also to discover ways in which St. Stanislaus Papczynski can be an inspiration for all of us today. St. Stanislaus was born on May 18, 1631, in the Polish village of Podogrodzie, which is near the Carpathian Mountains along the southern border of Poland. His parents named him John, probably after St. John the Baptist. He would later receive the name Stanislaus of Jesus and Mary when he entered the Piarist order. Incidentally, about three centuries later, Pope St. John Paul II would be born on the same day, May 18th. Divine providence is a very important theme in the life of St. Stanislaus, even before his birth. While John's mother was pregnant with him, while she was crossing the Dunayats River in a boat, a storm came up. In her anxiety for the unborn child, she prayed and offered her son unreservedly to Jesus and Mary. A gust of wind then knocked her from the boat into the river, but she did not drown. Many have seen in this story the first sign of God's providential love for the future founder of the Marian order. John Papczynski was the last of eight children, as a boy, he used to build small altars and organize little processions. This caused some worry among some of the neighbors because they superstitiously thought that his processions might be harbingers of the plague. From his mother, John developed a deep devotion to Mary. It is probably she who placed above his bed a big picture of the Blessed Virgin Mary. But little John was not totally absorbed in piety. He loved to get out and enjoy the natural beauty which surrounded the village, especially in the mountains and hills. But life in Poland during the time of St. Stanislaus was difficult for primarily two reasons. The first is that Poland was under attack from every direction. Along the eastern and southern borders, Poland was periodically invaded by Orthodox Cossacks from the Ukraine and Muscovites from Russia, as well as by Muslim Tatars on the northern and western fronts. The devastating Thirty Years' War brought invasions by Swedes and Prussians. For this reason, this time period in the 17th century became known as the Deluge. Sadly, the Poles won very few victories and death was a constant reality. The second reason that the 17th century was such a difficult time period was that plagues claimed the lives of many, and not only in Poland, but in all of Europe. One of the most serious epidemics occurred in Naples in 1656, where the plague took the lives of 300,000 people and from there spread rapidly throughout all of Europe. Another outbreak of the plague occurred in London in 1664, which took the lives of 70,000 people, which was nearly one-sixth of the city's population. So together, wars and the plague claimed the lives of many in Poland. In fact, the population dropped from about 10 million to 6 million people during that time, with so much death. It is no wonder 
that Father Papchinsky felt so compelled to pray for the souls of the dying and for those in purgatory, especially those who were unprepared for death because they could not make a confession or receive the anointing of the sick. Praying for the deceased and the dying would eventually become an essential component of the charism of the Marian Fathers. In his early life, John Papchinsky himself suffered from the plague and other plague-like illnesses. Twice he suffered from an epidemic that was so serious that he became unconscious, but it was reported that on one occasion he recovered his health by the simple act of drinking a glass of water. Later, at the age of 17, St. Stanislaus contracted the plague, which left sores over his entire body. But he was soon healed, seemingly miraculously, after some dogs came and licked his wounds. Again, God's providence spared the life of this future saint. The constant threat of war and the plague took its toll on the education system. John Papchinsky's village school only offered a third grade education, and to continue his studies, he had to travel 100 miles to attend another school run by the Jesuits. After his bout with the plague, he attended a different school run by the Pyrists, but it closed after only one year in anticipation of another outbreak of the plague in 1649. John then switched to a Jesuit college in Lvov, but after one year, it too was closed on account of the threat of war with the Cossacks. John Papchinsky eventually completed his college education at the age of 23. After that, the future saint joined the Pyrrhist Fathers, where he received the religious name Stanislaus of Jesus and Mary. Although we know nothing about his interior discernment process, nevertheless, the very fact that he chose to join the Pyrrhists, who are also known as the Poor Clerics Regular of the Mother of God of Pious Schools, it conveys to us three facts. First, by the title we see that he chose an order dedicated to the Mother of God. Second, that he valued education, especially among young people who, like himself, did not have access to a good education. Third, that he preferred to serve the Lord as a priest in an active order of clerics regular, since the Pyrrhists were one of the relatively new orders of clerics regular, like the Jesuits, the Barnabites, and the Theatines. In his first year of theology studies in Warsaw, an interesting event occurred which reveals to us St. Stanislaus's zeal and is another demonstration of God's providence in his life. It was during the time of the deluge, when the Swedes had attacked Poland and in fact had just captured Warsaw. One day, Papchinsky and a companion were walking back to the seminary when suddenly a Swedish soldier sprang upon them and drew his sword. Years later, Papchinsky wrote about the event saying, my companion, even though he was German, ran away and I fell to my knees, bared my neck and braced myself for the blow. However, by the decree of divine providence, I did not sustain any wounds, even though I was struck three times with great force, which caused such great pain that I felt it for almost an hour and a half. So St. Stanislaus survived this attempt on his life, completed his seminary studies, and was ordained to the priesthood in 1661. He spent the next 12 years of his life in zealous priestly ministry for the Pyrrhists. He served as a professor of rhetoric, was an eloquent preacher, and promoted a confraternity for the formation of the laity. Among his penitents were a number of distinguished prelates, bishops, and senators. His most famous penitent was the apostolic nuncio, Anthony Pignatelli, who later became Pope Innocent XII. This was certainly a time of intense and fruitful labor for St. Stanislaus. One bishop described Papchinsky during this time period as a tireless worker in the vineyard of the Lord. Yet God had further plans for this zealous priest. Due to some internal conflicts and some differences of opinion over the interpretation of the laws of the Pyrrhus congregation, Papchinsky requested and was granted a dispensation from his religious vows in 1670. But in his heart, he wanted to remain avowed religious. So in the very act of receiving his dispensation, he made a personal promise to the Lord to found a new congregation, the Marian Fathers of the Immaculate Conception. This vow is called his oblation or offering, which reads like this. I promise until the end of my life, chastely and with fervor, to serve God and Mary Immaculate in this society of the Marian Fathers of the Immaculate Conception, which, with the grace of God, I desire to found, and to whose laws, statutes, and rights I will adapt my behavior. St. Stanislaus spent two years as a chaplain to a noble family called the Karskis. It was here that he wrote the rule for the new congregation called Norma Vitae, which means the rule of life. And he also changed his black cassock which he had worn as a Pyrrhist, for a white one, which he would now wear as a Marian. 
During this time, Father Stanislaus performed a miracle. Mr. and Mrs. Karski's son, Joseph, had been run over by a cart and was close to death. Father Stanislaus said to the boy as he was lying in bed, Joseph, get up and hurry. You will serve Holy Mass for me. And at that very moment, Joseph sprang to his feet and followed Father Stanislaus to the chapel. While staying with the Karskis, St. Stanislaus also began seeking out members for his new congregation. And he eventually found some in a rather unlikely place, a hermitage in the Korobia Forest in the vicinity of Warsaw. In the fall of 1672, Papchinsky visited the group of hermits and proposed to them his ideas for his new congregation. The leader of the hermits, Stanislaus Krajewski, liked Papchinsky's ideas, and so he offered him his property and accepted Norma Vitae, the rule of life, which Papchinsky had written. Thus, Krajewski became the second member of the Marian Fathers. On September 30th, 1673, Father Papchinsky bid farewell to the Karskis and moved to his new home in the Korobia Forest where he assumed his role as the director of the hermits. He tried to introduce some religious discipline by introducing them to his rule of life. He woke them up early and made them pray more than they wanted. Then on October 24th, 1673, the Bishop Stanislaus Schwitzitsky made a visitation of the Korobiev Hermitage. He was very strict and he officially made Father Stanislaus superior of the hermits. He also approved Papchinsky's rule of life, but added to it some other very strict decrees, which were in keeping with an order of hermits. This formal act of approval by the Bishop on October 24th, 1673, marks the official date of the foundation of the Marian congregation. Unfortunately, because Sviatitsky's decrees were so strict, all of the other hermits, with the exception of St. Stanislaus and Krajewski, left the hermitage. Pauczynski himself called the statutes of the bishop most rigid. This consideration raises the question, why then did Pauczynski accept the approval of his institute as an order of hermits? It is because, above all, he wanted his institute to receive formal ecclesiastical approval, either at the diocesan level or at the pontifical level. Papchinsky knew that the diocesan path was easier, and his earlier attempts at seeking papal approval prior to meeting Krajewski had proved futile. But bishops could only approve institutes according to a form that was already approved by the Holy See. Institutes of clerics regular, like the Jesuits and the Pyrists, could only be approved by the Holy See. According to our Marian historian, Father Kazimir Krzyzinowski, it was probably for this reason that Papchinsky accepted the approval of his congregation by the local bishop as an order of hermits. It was an easier path than the pontifical approval which Papchinsky had already tried but could not obtain. Thus, in order to be approved, the Marians had to accept approval as an order of hermits. This surprising path reveals to us something of the virtues of Saint Stanislaus. Unlike the other hermits who fled, Papchinsky was obedient to the visitator bishop, recognizing that obedience was the path for the salvation of his soul. According to Papchinsky, I strive for nothing except the salvation of my soul, which indeed everyone should place before all else and do everything to attain, even if this should be most difficult. Having resolved to fulfill the desires of the visitator, St. Stanislaus modified his rule of life by inserting the bishop's statutes. And he began the construction there in the Korobia forest of a house of recollection along with an oratory. These steps reveal the flexibility on the part of St. Stanislaus who preferred obedience to the bishop over his own ideals of the religious life. Once again, it reveals St. Stanislaus's trust in divine providence. Living as a hermit did not quench the apostolic spirit of St. Stanislaus. During those four years as a hermit, Papchinsky frequently carried out pastoral services in neighboring parishes. He preached, heard confessions, and in 1675, he even published a book for the laity titled The Mystical Temple of God. St. Stanislaus was also blessed with mystical experiences. On one occasion, while at dinner with a noble family, he had a vision of the souls in purgatory. After a few moments, he rose from the table intending to return to the hermitage, but there was no easy way out of the crowded room. So, to the astonishment of all, it is reported that the saint stood up and walked through the middle of the table, the guests and the food completely undisturbed, as if there were no table there at all. Upon returning to the hermitage, he simply said to his fellow Marians, pray for the dead. And he locked himself in his room for several days, praying and fasting for the souls in purgatory. St. Stanislaus slowly attracted a few like-minded members 
And in 1677, four years after the approval of the congregation, the bishop entrusted Papchinsky with the care of a chapel at Gora Calvaria. Gora Calvaria was an entire town modeled after the city of Jerusalem, with chapels marking the different stations of the cross. The Marians received the chapel of the Lord's Supper. Since it was the first chapel, pilgrims frequently asked the Marians to accompany them to all the other chapels along the way of the cross. Naturally, the Marians would receive donations for their ministry, which also brought the price tag of much criticism and jealousy among the other religious orders and even among some of the laity who lived nearby. Several of them went so far as to physically attack Father Papchinsky. Following such persecutions, the attackers would often become gravely ill, but then they would get better after apologizing to him. St. Stanislaus worked many miracles and wonders during his lifetime. His prayers brought the grace of healing and even raised people from the dead. For example, one day, a despairing mother came to the chapel to ask St. Stanislaus to intercede for her dying daughter. I know why you are here, the saint said. Your daughter is dead. Nevertheless, he told her to have the girl's body brought to the chapel and placed on the table in the middle of the chapel, representing the table of the Last Supper. Then, St. Stanislaus began to offer the Mass. During the Mass, to the astonishment of all, the girl came to life, sat up, and held out her arms toward the altar. In the years following the establishment of the Marians at Gora Calvaria, the number of Marians slowly increased, and in 1690, at the age of nearly 60, St. Stanislaus himself decided to walk to Rome to try one more time to obtain pontifical approval for his religious institute. Since the Marians were, at that time, only approved by their bishop, if a new bishop came along who might want to change something about the Marians, he would be able to do so. He could even disband them entirely. So, in order to prevent such interference, St. Stanislaus journeyed to Rome to seek pontifical approval. Unfortunately, he arrived during a time of sede vacante, when the previous pope had just died and a new pope had not yet been elected. In those days, it could be years before a new pope was elected. So St. Stanislaus returned to Poland disappointed. Ironically, one or two days after he left Rome, the new pope was elected. It was Father Pepczynski's former penitent, Pignatelli. Unfortunately, poor Stanislaus was already on the road home. St. Stanislaus did not give up, however, in seeking papal approval of his order. In 1698, now approaching 70 years of age and physically unable to make the journey, he sent his fellow Marian priest, Father Joachim of St. Anne Kozlowski, to Rome to represent him. Various important people, both clergy and laity, gave testimony to the exemplary religious life of the Marians and of their generous apostolic labor. The Holy See then approved the Marians as an order of clerics regular on November 24, 1699. In fact, they were the last of the clerics regular to be approved by the church. The Holy See, however, did not approve St. Stanislaus' rule of life, Norma Vitae. Instead, they insisted that the Marians choose an existing rule. Therefore, Father Joachim, when he was in Rome, chose the rule of the Ten Virtues of the Blessed Virgin Mary, which he received from the Franciscans. In the end, Pope Innocent XII recognized the new juridical status of the Marians under the title of the Immaculate Conception with the task of helping the souls in purgatory and of assisting pastors. St. Stanislaus made his own solemn vows on July 6, 1701, only three months before his death. His task had been completed. The Marian order was now secure. St. Stanislaus died on September 17, 1701 in Gora Calvaria near Warsaw. He was beatified on September 16, 2007 at the Marian Shrine in Lehen. And now he has been canonized on June 5, 2016 at St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. His feast day is his birthday, May 18. Owing to the miracles that he performed both during his life and after his death, St. Stanislaus is invoked as a patron saint of many causes, including unborn children, couples wishing to start a family, and children with learning difficulties. The first miracle of St. Stanislaus, which led to his beatification, was an amazing pro-life miracle. In 2001, a young woman in Poland was experiencing complications in her pregnancy. She went to the doctor and sadly, two tests confirmed that the baby had died in her womb. Now, the baby was far enough advanced that she had to come back in a few days later to have the child surgically removed. But in the meantime, her godfather, decided to pray to our founder, Stanislaus Papczynski. He prayed a novena, and on the eighth day, when the woman went back in to have the child removed, to everyone's amazement, the doctors discovered 
This baby isn't dead. He's alive. The child was born perfectly healthy. And six years later, during the mass of beatification, that child carried up the gifts to the altar. What was the miracle that led to the canonization of St. Stanislaus Papczynski? It involved the healing of a 20-year-old woman in Poland shortly after his beatification in 2007. The woman was suffering from a respiratory problem that resembled that of a common cold. All attempts at treatment with a variety of antibiotics ended in failure. Her condition deteriorated. She lost consciousness and her body began to shut down. The doctor informed the family that her lungs were destroyed and her death was imminent. After consultation with the family, the doctors decided to remove her from life support. This was on Wednesday of Holy Week. The mother, filled with grief, went to her parish church to pray. There, a catechist noticed her crying, approached her, and handed her a booklet that contained instructions on praying a novena through the intercession of Blessed Stanislaus. The woman urged the mother to recite it and to place confidence in God's grace working through Blessed Stanislaus. The mother, together with her husband and other family members, began to pray the novena. Even though the young woman had been removed from life support, she did not die. On the contrary, she regained consciousness. Several days into the novena, the woman fully recovered. Seeing the turnaround in her condition, the doctors took an x-ray of her lungs. To their total disbelief, her lungs were fully healed, resembling those of a newborn infant. This was on the ninth and last day of the novena. She was discharged from the hospital during Easter week with a cure for which medical science had no explanation. She proceeded with her wedding plans, which had been arranged before her illness. Within a few weeks, the wedding took place. She and her husband now have two children, and her health is in perfect order. A medical team of the Holy See reviewed the case and unanimously approved that the woman's cure had no natural or scientific explanation. By God's providence, the ruling was made on September 17, 2015, the anniversary of St. Stanislaus's death. St. Stanislaus was canonized on June 5, 2016. How blessed we are as Marians of the Immaculate Conception to be able, finally, to call our founder, Stanislaus Pepchinski, a saint. St. Stanislaus, pray for us. And now I'll offer you my priestly blessing through the intercession of St. Stanislaus Papchinski and the Immaculate Mother of God. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.